Hi everyone and welcome to this video on hair loss treatments. Today I'll be covering treatments ranging from topicals and oral medication to experimental therapies. As always, remember to consult your doctor before starting any new treatment. So let's dive in. First, let's talk about topical treatments. 5% topical minoxidil plus trentinoin or some topical retinol. Minoxidil works by using the sulfur transferase enzyme. This enzyme is present on your scalp and skin and it turns minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate, which actually grows your hair. So the active ingredient responsible for growing your hair is minoxidil sulfate, and that happens when you apply the topical liquid minoxidil to your scalp, and it makes contact with the sulfur transferase enzyme. Now, some people don't have a presence or high enough presence of sulfur transferase enzyme on the scalp, so they won't respond well to minoxidil. You can, however, apply trentinoin to your scalp and 10 minutes later, apply topical minoxidil. The trentinoin will supercharge your minoxidil and help turn that minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate, which will help your hair growth. Now, when it comes to picking the right topical minoxidil, you can use it in liquid form, preferably propylene gly glycol free, or as a foam. Foam is good in my opinion, as it usually doesn't have any PG. I just let the foam sit inside of a little cap and let the foam fizz out so when it becomes a liquid, I can use a pipette dropper to apply it to my scalp. And you want to apply this directly to your scalp, make sure that you're making contact with the scalp itself because so many people make mistakes of putting it on top of the hair and that doesn't actually allow the minoxidil to work effectively. You wanna make sure that you allow the liquid to make contact with your scalp. And it doesn't have to be like your scalp drenched in minoxidil. Just contact in a general area can have broad localized effects. So just be wise. More doesn't mean better. So up next, we have 5% stemoxidine. Stemoxidine works by creating a hypoxia environment on your scalp, which stimulates hair follicles to start growing earlier. It is designed to be used once a day for three months at a time. You can go longer, but people usually cycle in three months in intervals. So three months on, three months off, so on and so forth. A cool thing about stemoxidine is that your hair doesn't become reliant on it when you stop using it after three months. So this is why many people use it as an alternative, as a growth stimulant to minoxidil. However, it isn't as strong as minoxidil but it is a good alternative that is effective. I mentioned before that it creates a hypoxia environment. The hypoxia environment, basically low oxygen levels, which actually induces the stem cells in your hair follicles to start growing hairs. Finally, rosemary oil or some sort of oil for your scalp. I didn't pick rosemary because of its alleged growth properties. There's this study that it says that it's just as effective as minoxidil, but this is a poorly conducted study. This isn't the purpose of the video to debunk this claim, but I will revisit this later in maybe a future video or some sort of comment. However, oils in general can help keep your scalp healthy and moist for the most part. A dry scalp, especially with all these topicals that you're applying, is not ideal and can increase the chances of irritation and dandruff on your scalp. It's worth mentioning that you shouldn't apply oils directly after applying minoxidil or even before using minoxidil because this will prevent minoxidil from being absorbed into your scalp and thus reaching your hair follicles. I would apply oils maybe three times a week, and when you do apply oils, I would say wait about an hour to do it, as the minoxidil would have dried by then on your scalp. But remember, don't apply too much oil, sometimes more is better. Um, some oil recommendations that I have is argan oil, coconut oil, um, those are some of my favorite, along with some sort of castor oil supplementation to the scalp. Okay, now let's discuss oral treatments. Standard. 1 milligram oral finasteride. We all know about finasteride. It decreases DHT systemically by inhibiting the type 2 5-alpha reductase enzyme from converting testosterone into DHT. We know that DHT destroys the scalp hair follicles and that the enzyme is present on the scalp. If you take finasteride, it decreases the presence of scalp DHT by 30 to 40% and systemically by 70%. Next, 
a bit of a stronger DHT blocker or re reducer, um, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor dutasteride. So 0.5 milligrams to 2 milligrams of dutasteride blocks all three types of 5-alpha reductase enzymes and also more of the type 2 5-alpha reductase enzyme than finasteride. At 0.5 milligrams of dutasteride, scalp DHT is lowered by 50%. However, the more you take up to 2.3 milligrams of dutasteride will bring down scalp DHT by 80 to 90 percent. And it's been found that dutasteride helps grow your hair faster than finasteride would. So you're also going to have to contend with the near 90 to 99 percent reduction of systemic DHT, depending on which range of dutasteride milligram you take. So that's something to consider. This could increase side effects, especially people who are prone to things such as gynecomastia. But nevertheless, dutasteride is just as safe as finasteride for a vast majority of men. Now, people usually resort to dutasteride when finasteride hasn't been working for them. And in reality, finasteride halts hair loss in most cases. In most cases, people see growth, a slowdown of, progre of uh, progressing androgenic alopecia, but some people, they just don't get any response whatsoever, so they go to dutasteride, and others, they want that extra sense of security, and they also want that fast regrowth when it comes to s shedding cycles, so they just hop to dutasteride, not because finasteride isn't working, but they probably will get more efficacious and earlier results with dutasteride. So that's one reason why, or some reasons why, people may resort to using dutasteride. So now, I guess we're at the midpoint of this video, but the standard hair loss stack, at least from what I've seen from people on the internet, from people that I've talked to in real life, so the standard hair loss stack, you're going to need 5% topical minoxidil, 1 milligram oral finasteride, and also kinoconazole shampoo, which for some people, uh, I mean, there's some debate about this, but it has been shown to be at least a mild anti-androgen. However, this has been shown to make people's scalp hair a bit dry and brittle, but also it's good for attacking dandruff. I will say as an optional sort of treatment, if you're not getting any sort of topical minoxidil boost if you're not seeing that your hair is growing to topical minoxidil or you think it's not working or you just want that extra sense of assurance using trentinoin on your scalp will boost minoxidil convert minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate which is the active ingredient in growing hair so now we're getting into the special section these are some treatments that are a bit niche and are coming to the market if not already here Cosma RNA is a promising novel treatment for androgenetic alopecia. It uses siRNA to suppress the expression of the androgen receptor on the scalp. This limits the number of androgen receptors in the hair follicle, and by doing so, it decreases the opportunities for DHT and other androgens to bind to that hair follicle and cause degradation and damage, which would lead to balding. The great thing about this is that you only have to apply Cosma RNA or this siRNA product once a week to your scalp. However, when this product reaches market, it's more than likely that it's going to be expensive, but it's coming to the market sometime within Q3 of 2023. So it's promising. It'll only be available in South Korea and the European markets, but hopefully we can get it here in the United States and maybe ship it overseas for some people who want to experiment with it. It's like a one-time purchase thing. I think it's worth it, even if it's a bit expensive, because in reality, you just have to apply it once a week to your scalp. I think that's less of a hassle than taking a medication every single day, so it's more than likely that people are going to stay on the regimen, as it's pretty much easy to do. Topical dutasteride and finasteride are often made by compounding pharmacies that require a prescription. I personally wouldn't use these because I have younger family members that I'm around and the males, you know, you know how 
boys are. They like to rough house and touch my hair or whatever. So I wouldn't want them to be exposed to any sort of anti-androgens at a young age. Also, topical finasteride, in my opinion, is kind of a gimmick because it goes systemic anyway. Topical dutasteride, on the other hand, has been claimed to not go systemic due to its higher molecular weight. It's small enough to go through the scalp, but not large enough to filter into the bloodstream. So that's something to consider. However, they do work. I don't want it to make the impression that these topical versions of finasteride and dutasteride don't work. They, they do work. Now for oral minoxidil, this does work. However, it has risks that have not been proven to be dose dependent, which means you could be taking 0.5 milligrams or 2 milligrams, 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, whatever of minoxidil, oral minoxidil, and you could get side effects. Now, there are people who are going to argue that, oh, it's overblown, but the data just isn't out there. Does it work? Yes, it does work. Oral minoxidil will work if you use it. It will work so well that you'll find that it's growing hair all over your body. Now, I will say that I don't personally use it, but this is just the realities and the mechanism of oral minoxidil. So I would say consult a cardiologist before you try oral minoxidil. You want to make sure that you don't have any sort of unknown heart conditions, any sort of blood pressure issues, whether it's hypertension or hypotension, because you don't want to negatively impact your health by taking oral minoxidil, especially if you're already taking other medication, blood pre pressure medication, blood thinner medication that may interact with oral minoxidil. So just be very, very cautious if you go this route. Now we're going to go into another section, the experimental treatments. When it comes to experimental, I would generally caution against it. Some are FDA approved and may be used off-label like oral minoxidil, which I would count in this section as well as being a special category, like I put in before. However, there are more experimental drugs that are made in gray market laboratories. It's generally not a good idea to get into the aspect of self-treating with medication that hasn't even been made in a lab that has good oversight or has FDA or some broad government oversight. However, people can make decisions for themselves. And I'm, in my opinion, I think people should take whatever drugs they want as long as it doesn't hurt anyone around them. Physically, that is, if you want to take drugs, it's your body, your choice, but you should be made fully aware of the consequences when doing so. So let's get into some of the experimental treatments, some FDA approved, some not, where we could use to treat androgenetic alopecia. So Brizula or CB0301, clastoclodrone is already approved, already an FDA approved product for acne. And clastoclodrone is the active ingredient in Brizula or CB0301. However, it has been found to have anti-DHT, anti-androgen properties, and it's currently under clinical trials as a topical anti-androgen. If I'm not mistaken, I think they're in phase three of their clinical trials, maybe late stage phase two, but it does have a safety profile already when it comes to acne. So this is one of the safer experimental treatments, in my opinion, that somebody may use. Up next is pyrolytamide. This has been going the works. Everyone's going crazy over it. Pyrolytamide, also known as KX826, is made by Kintour Pharmaceuticals. And it is also a topical anti-androgen that is under clinical trials in the United States and China. And it looks very promising at the moment with a good safety profile. Then we have Lantapros and Bermatapros. These are prostaglandin analogs that are already used to grow eyelashes, like in Latisse, that product that people put on their eyelashes to grow it. But you need a prescription, and it's kind of expensive. But people have experimented using Latanopros and Bromatopros for their scalp hair, which has had varying effects. Some stack this with Minoxidil, and to be honest, you can look it up online, but they have good growth from this sort of stack. But there's an issue with using prostaglandins. Sometimes it may not be good for cardiovascular health, 
So that is a risk you want to keep in mind and get consistent blood work if you do go this route. Finally, RU58841. RU has been around for decades and it is mostly experimental. It is a topical anti-androgen, however, it has a limited safety profile with zero published human clinical trials. But when looking at its mechanism along with the pictures of many people on the internet who have used RU, it in theory blocks androgen receptors uh, such that testosterone or even DHT cannot bind to them, which allows the hair follicles to not be damaged by DHT and other androgens. I would caution against this as well because we don't know if this is safe. We don't know anything about RU5841 from a clinical perspective in regards to human beings. So it could go systemic. And if this anti-androgen, topical anti-androgen goes systemic, it has a lot of issues where it can block androgen receptors throughout the body. And we only want it to block androgen receptors in the scalp. We want localized effects, not systemic effects. We want to limit systemic effects. But we don't know if RU58841 doesn't go systemic. So just be careful if you use RU. There is also another topical anti-androgen called Floridil. And Floridil is unique because when it makes contact with water, it breaks down automatically. But this is why you should only apply it to a dry scalp. With Floridil, it binds to the androgen receptors in the scalp, which just like RU would allow the scalp hair not to become damaged by DHT and other androgens. However, it does have a limited safety profile in the clinical trial in humans, but to my knowledge, I think it's only been approved in Eastern Europe and it's not been FDA approved, but in theory, it shouldn't have systemic side effects because, again, if it were to enter the bloodstream, it would nearly instantly deteriorate due to its properties being very susceptible to hydrolysis. So, yeah, a bit of a long video, a bit of a commentary here and there, but I just wanted to do a bit of a review of hair loss products and ways you could go about creating a hair loss stack. You could get a topical anti-androgen like Floridil or CB0301, pair that with a growth stimulant like minoxidil and stamoxidine, then take an oral anti-androgen that's safe for males like finasteride or dutasteride. And now with COSMRNA, we can use that on our scalps as well with the other products. So there's just so many ways we can go about now, these days, actual scientific ways, not fancy you know, natural homeopathic ways to stop hair loss. These are scientific ways to address hair loss and get regrowth, especially at the early stages. So that's why I wanted to make these videos, just to bring awareness so people know that it is possible if you catch hair loss early, that you can get regrowth. And if anything, you can halt hair loss or slow it down as a male going through androgenetic alopecia. Well, that's pretty much it. Sorry for the long video, but hopefully you've watched a good deal of it. And if you made it to the end, comment below. I made it to the end. <laughs> Nothing special to add here. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching. Bye, guys. See you on the next one. Peace.